Well, we're going to Hollywood in just a moment to talk about some very strange horror films. That's next on Coast to Coast AM. Well, it's Friday. Welcome back. Stephen Shohat has worked for more than 10 years as a tour guide in Los Angeles, collecting hundreds of vintage Hollywood stories to tell the sightseers. A few years ago, he decided to take these tales beyond the tour buses and embarked on several unique and creative entrepreneurial projects. We've got them tonight on Coast to Coast AM. Stephen, how are you? Hey, great, George. How are you doing? Good. You're probably right around the corner from us. Uh, I'm in Palms, uh, near the Sony studio. There you are. Well, not too far away. Are you still a tour guide? Are you still doing that? still give tours, um, and uh, I have my book, Hollywood Stories, Short Entertaining Anecdotes about the Stars and Legends of the Movies. So I give private tours, and I work for a tour company called VIP Tours and Charters, and, and uh, I keep telling stories. I've seen a lot of people in these high-rise buses. Are those some of the things that you've been doing? Uh, you mean like a double decker? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I haven't actually done anything in a double decker yet, but I've done I, you know I, I've done in big buses. I've done private tours in people's cars, which is great because we can go on some some extra streets that you can't legally go on with the big bus. So so uh, you know I've done a lot of different types of vehicles, but not a double decker yet. Stephen, the people who are coming on these tours, where are they coming from? The United States or all over the planet? Well, with the dollar being low, like the uh, gentleman before me was saying, we we have been getting a lot of people from all across uh, all across the uh, planet, uh, and a lot of people in Europe. And uh, it, it's interesting because uh, our company has actually been busier after the summer ended. And, and one theory I heard that a lot of people weren't traveling from Europe because they were delaying because of the Olympics. But uh, you know, but I never know the reason why we're busy. I never know the reason why we're slow. I, I mean, there's just theories that go around, and and uh, you know, maybe some of them are true. Stephen, the people who take the tours, what do they what do they really want to see? Boy, everybody's kind of different. I get all sorts of different requests uh, from people. Uh, um, I, I mean, the tour I give, we go to Hollywood, we go to the Grove. People want to see the Hollywood sign very much. Um, um, we go to we go to Venice. Uh, sometimes people are disappointed with that. We, we go to Rodeo <laughs> Drive. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I I'll tell you what. I, I I tell them they can go into the hotel from Pretty Woman, the Four Seasons, Beverly Wilshire, and that'll be the bathroom highlight of the tour. <laughs> but uh, but sometimes the tour man won't let them in, so I have a backup bathroom just in case so uh, <laughs> you know you get different requests for for different things years ago it was oj 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 all the oh, time sure i thank goodness that's died down well you know it, it is amazing how people are just fascinated amazed with hollywood i've been out here for a number of years now so it wears off after a while but you're right i, I remember walking past that beverly hills hotel on wilshire and uh i heard some girl coming out of there one day going big mistake like well, julia can, roberts would say oh well can i can i tell you a story that happened there uh, michael kane spent his honeymoon there and his wife's a very beautiful lady her name is shakira uh she's british but of indian descent and they had been dating each other for a while and then she told him she was pregnant and she was scared to death because she'd seen the movie alfie and thought oh he's gonna leave me like you left that <laughs> alfie and he's like, darling, that's just a movie. I want to marry you. So, so they had the uh, marriage in, in Vegas and then the honeymoon in Beverly Hills because he had a movie to make out here. And so they spent the night at that hotel, the, the Beverly Wilshire. So the hotel, they love Michael Caine. So they said, uh, Michael, Shakira, in honor of your honeymoon, we, we have uh, made up for you the authentic Indian honeymoon suite. So they go into the suite, and Shakira can't believe it. There's a bed hanging from the ceiling, and there are bells underneath the bed, and there's a card on the bed that says, this is an Indian tradition. The neighbors like to hear the bells go off for the happy honeymoon couple. And, and, and Shakira says, Michael, what are they talking about? We have nothing like this in India. Nobody wants to hear the bells go off on their honeymoon night. He says, I know, darling, but let's just get some sleep. And they couldn't get any sleep because of the blankety-blank bells. So on his honeymoon night, Michael Keane ended up ordering four hamburgers from room service and stuffed the buns into the bells. Don't so <laughs> so muffle them. I love that. Stephen, what has been for you, and we're going to get into some of these horror films here in Hollywood, what has been the most bizarre thing that you've witnessed as a tour guide director? Uh, 
If you really want to know... I Th- that you can repeat I, on the radio, I, I, I guess. Yeah, I, if you really want to know, um, you know, you have these people dressed up in costumes on Hollywood Boulevard, and there have been some incidents with them. And I think the wildest one was, and this probably doesn't help sell tourism, um, Barney the Dinosaur uh, ran after some guy in the street and tackled him. <laughs> <laughs> right in front of the bus, and and uh, it was just so bizarre. See, they, they, they want to. Most of them are nice. What they want is to get tipped after pictures are taken with them and right. they stand on the sidewalk. They're not allowed to go to, on the property, and there've been all sorts of incidents. Uh, but uh, they're isolated. But like one time. Spider-Man hit Charlie Chaplin in the face, and the police came to arrest them. And there were so many Spider-Men, they didn't know which one to arrest. I didn't witness <laughs> that. Uh, you know, I witnessed Barney. And then, when, and then one time, uh, um, the Incredible Hulk grabbed a girl uh, with white pants on the rear, leaving green hand stains on her oh, white geez. pants. And and, and uh, he luckily was arrested and incarcerated and hopefully won't be seen again. Um, well, one time, uh, two Batmen started fighting each other. Uh, one time, the police went undercover to make sure that Elmo and Mr. Incredible, uh, they, they busted them for soliciting too hard. So, so some of these things I've seen and some of them I haven't. But I, I'd say that, that Barney... Doing that flying tackle was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen on a tour. The Hollywood Strip at night on weekends, it's a zoo down there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Try, try and avoid it and not give night tours. and Don't, don't want to go any place where there's traffic. But, yeah, there's, they, I mean, there's a lot of people. And, and you know, uh, obviously one of the places that's popular is the Comedy Store. Um, and and I, I could just tell a story that, that years ago, Mitzi Shore, the current owner, Polly Shore's mother, she didn't pay the comedians at the Comedy Store. It was around 1979, and a bunch of them went on strike. And she was very upset about it uh, because she had given some of them room and board and lent them money. And they, on the other hand, felt that she paid the bartenders, she paid the uh, waiters. Why didn't she pay them? And her point was, well, this is a showcase. You know, Robin Williams performed here. He was seen. Now he's on work in Mindy. So, so neither side would give in. And then one time one of the strikers was hit by a car as, as the vehicle left the comedy store. And, and the striker had to go to the hospital. And Mitzi Shore said, that's it. I'll settle. I don't want anybody hurt. And then she found out that the striker was faking his injuries, and she banned him from ever performing there again. And the name of that striker was Jay Leno. How about that? Good old Jay. Stephen, how did you get involved in all of this? Well, what happened was um, I, I, was, uh, I wanted to be a writer, and uh, I, I uh, was a limousine driver because I figured I could write while I was waiting for people in the limo. And then uh, I was asked to give tours, and I just found it very interesting. I'd already I, – I don't – I'd always been kind of interested in Hollywood anyway, so you know, I, I just shared a little bit of information. I got a really good response, and I thought, you know, even though I met some celebrities driving the limo and all that, giving a tour, giving a tour using your head is more interesting, at least it was to me, than just driving people from A to B. And what I found out with the tour company was we were free to do anything we wanted with the narration, and that that kept the job interesting because you have to see the same things all the time, but there was no limit to the stories that you can tell, and I still try and keep a freshness uh, with the stories. And then uh, after collecting a huge amount uh, of stories, that's when I had the idea for the book, Hollywood Stories, which has over a 1,000 anecdotes in it. Stephen, some of the old classics, of course, the horror films in Hollywood seem to live on forever and ever. You know a story about psycho Norman Bates, a lookalike, scaring people at Universal Studios. What happened there? Well, this is uh, uh, how I opened my book, and it's a story a gentleman told me on my tour. Um, the day before he had taken my uh, the city tour, uh, he had taken his family up to Universal Studios, and they were going by where Alfred Hitchcock made the movie Psycho, which is, of course, part of the tour. So the tour guide was telling the story about how Hitchcock shot the film, and all of a sudden, a man came up from behind the Bates Motel, 
with a wig and a dress and a knife. And everybody on the bus is laughing, you know, Norman Bates and drag, isn't this funny? And then the tour guide says, ladies and gentlemen, this man is not part of the tour. I don't know who he is. And who would believe that, right? Right, right. And and, and so now, you know, it's, it's not as funny anymore. And this guy's running toward the tram, yelling and screaming, raises the knife. People start screaming. And he took off the wig. And it was Jim Carrey. <laughs> Impromptu, right? Uh, Impromptu. He was making the movie The Man on the Moon, had a little downtime, and decided to scare everybody half to death. Yeah. And then uh, the nice part of the story was that afterwards he took pictures and signed autographs. That's funny. Well, you know, Hitchcock was a weird guy, wasn't he? Well, he was very eccentric. Uh, um I mean, he would play practical jokes all the time. He would, like, like, like Shirley MacLaine talked about when she was in the movie The Trouble of ha- with Harry, which was a 1955 movie about people in Vermont trying to dispose of a dead body, and they think they might be, each one of them thinks they might have been responsible for doing the poor guy in. And it was a real, you know, British type of humor, and it, it didn't do very well. But when Hitchcock would give direction to Shirley MacLaine, he would say something like, dog's feet. And she would say, what is dog's feet? Dog, pause. He wants me to pause. You know, and, and, and that was his way of, of communicating sometimes. And, and, just, and, and you had to figure it out. Right, yeah. And he was just a very, very um, eccentric character. Now, other times, of course, you know, he, he's, you know, impatient and, 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 and would, would uh, want to get things done and, and, and would probably more communicate more directly and not have time for the eccentric stuff. So... So, I, I mean, there were moments. It, 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 it used to amaze the people who were uh, working for him, the things he would do on the television show Alfred Hitchcock Presents, like like dress up in baby's clothes or, or walk around with a prop axe in his head or something like that, um, <laughs> because they thought of him as such a dignified man. Yeah. And, 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 you know, somehow he always did keep his dignity in a way, but, but he would do anything on that show practically. And, huh? and of course... You know, he had the running gag where, where he would he would uh, rip the sponsors a new one, except they'd have to record it twice because he couldn't do that in 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 Europe because it didn't go over well. But in America, uh, you know, he he made fun of the sponsors and they didn't like it at first. But then it's kind of like the movie Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. They they realized that it was good advertising for them to sort of make light of themselves, and and it turned out to be very effective. Was he afraid of police? Yes, he was. Uh, he, he, you know, when he was a little boy, um, his he did something naughty, and his father sent him to a local constable and locked him up. And, and he said that it led him to a lifelong fear of police. Um, and, and that's one of the things he did with the movie Psycho, where, where you, you know, in the script, um, there's a policeman who stops Janet Lee on the road, and he's supposed to be flirtatious. But but Hitchcock changed it to where he's sinister, and he, he bought the policeman dark glasses, and he's constantly peering into Janet right. Lee, and, and that and that expressed Hitchcock's feelings. I mean, he did drive, but he was kind of nervous to drive because he was always afraid of being pulled over. And that, that he, was the police officer who got attacked by Norman Bates, wasn't it? No, going that, up the steps or something. No, that's uh, Martin Balsam. Okay. So this was a little bit earlier. I, Psycho is a movie, well, I don't want to give it away, but it's divided into two halves. You know, you have the Janet Lee half and the and the second half, which is the investigation, and Martin Balsam was in the second half. Okay. Yeah. I had heard weird stories about Hitchcock, Stephen, that he would tie up some of his uh, male and female leads to like a pole and leave them there all night screaming and yelling they couldn't go to the bathroom they were tied to a pole had you ever heard that yeah well i i i heard that he he uh, madeline carroll and robert donay on on 39 steps that, that he had ha- handcuffed them together on the 39 steps but the but the story was uh it's kind of a gross story i i mean i didn't put this in my book but the one story is that that he 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 uh made a bet with a cameraman that he'd be afraid to spend the night handcuffed to a camera and so the cameraman agreed to do it, and, and Hitch, this, this was when he was still in England. So Hitchcock handcuffed the guy to the camera and said, here, old boy, here's a bottle of brandy to help you get through the night. And, and uh, it was laced with a powerful accident. Oh, my God, not funny at all. We're going to be back. We'll talk more about some horror films. Stephen Showett, our guest, his book, Hollywood Stories, 
I'm George Nori. This is Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Nori with our special guest, Stephen Schoet, author of Hollywood Stories. Stephen, I love the old classics, the black and white ones, the horror films like Dracula, Frankenstein. They were made here too, weren't they? Yeah, at Universal Studios. Uh, um, I mean, they they initially were were theatrical productions, uh, both both Dracula and Frankenstein, and then and then Universal, uh, the people over there decided they wanted to do them, and 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 it, it, you know it, it gets a little murky with the history sometimes because uh, uh, Lon Chaney was most people's. Uh, preferred uh, Dracula, but the thing was, he was under contract to MGM, and then and then he died. So they had uh, this actor come to town uh, named Bella Lugosi, who was forty nine, and, and he was married at the time. And, and then uh, Clara Bow, the silent film star, came to watch him play in Dracula, and they started having an affair. Oh. And, and the resulting scandal, although it ruined his second marriage really raised his profile in Hollywood, and he ended up doing the role. Although uh, one of the reasons why Universal liked to make horror movies is because they really didn't have to pay people very much money uh, to, to play roles like, like Dracula, Frankenstein, the, the Mummy. If they asked for too much money, they'd usually get replaced, and, and they were hoping the public really wouldn't pay that much attention to the difference. Like in Frankenstein, the guy's in costume most of the time, or made up, right? Right, right. Well, you know, Boris Karloff, uh, see, they, they at first it was going to be Lugosi, and then, it, again, contradictory stories. Either he was fired um, or, or uh, he didn't want to do it because he had no lines. Uh, you know, the fired story is the more common version because his makeup test didn't do very well. And also he had a bad skin condition. So, um, Karloff was 44. He happened to be sitting at the Universal Cafeteria, and James Whale happened to see him and, and offered him the job. And, and Karloff had made like 13 movies that year and had known really tough times and was not a household name, was not getting paid very much, and he immediately agreed. And, and so then it, it was hours and hours of makeup with Jack Pierce and, and wearing this very, very heavy costumes, and there are all sorts of stories. And, and, and probably, you know, some of them are a bit apocryphal. Like the one story, as soon as he was Frankenstein, the, the, as soon as he was in the Munster costume, he left the studio, went straight over to Groucho Marx's house, knocked on the door. Uh, um, Groucho's maid answered the door. He Groucho's upstairs. He hears a loud scream and a, a, a <laughs> plop as, as the maid faints, and he's scared to death and hides under the bed. And, 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 and uh, you know, the, the Munster says, I just came over to to say hello, Groucho. Groucho never came out and, <laughs> and swore the story was true, but th- there weren't many people to corrobor- corroborate it. So, uh, it, you know, it's one of those things. The, the other thing was that, that um, one night Karloff finished very, very late, and he had a garden, and, and he always ha- had had days where, where he, had, he had been starving. So he always made sure that he grew that garden just in case things went south in the acting career. That was yeah. smart, yeah. Yeah, but but to actually see him do that in the Frankenstein's Munster, Munster <laughs> outfit uh, caused a lot of traffic and breaking and things like that. Now, if he really, you know, it, it might be hard to believe that he actually was allowed to take the costume out of the studio. The, the one time I know he did it, he played in a celebrity baseball game as Frankenstein's monster and, and, and scored a run and stamped his foot on the plate and, 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 you know, Joey Brown, the comedian, fainted. But but the other times are open to question where whether or not he actually got out of there with that costume on. So Bella Lugosi was Dracula. Boris was Frankenstein. Lon Chaney was Wolfman, right? Yeah, Henry Hall was the an, an, an original Wolfman, and that didn't work out very much. And again, because uh, you have an actor with, with Hall, a British actor who just didn't want to be covered with facial hair because he thought he'd ruin it would ruin his features. But that's the whole point, uh, um, you know, whether or not an actor is willing to do that or not, and he wasn't. So Lon Chaney Jr. Um, was willing to do it, although he had a lot of complaints uh, uh, about how difficult that was. And, and uh, you know, he, he, he used to do crazy things. I, I mean, he was uh, 
Uh, originally, he was a plumber, and, and then his plumbing business went south, and so he decided to follow his father's footsteps, um, Lon Chaney Sr., into the movie business. And, and because of um, union policies, he really couldn't do his own makeup like his father used to do, and that kind of disappointed him. And, and he would do things like, like he would you know, sneak up behind his co-stars and put his hairy paws on them when he was dressed up like the Wolfman and scare them. Or, or, you know, challenge other actors to shin-kicking contests. And, and one of the theories was that he was a nice guy, but when he was the Wolfman, he could only drink to a straw. <laughs> and so the other actors would, would uh, you know, when he wasn't looking, would put hot peppers into his soup, and it would really set him off. Who were the Who were the actors, do you know, who played in, like, the Creature from the Black Lagoon or the Mummy? Well, the Mummy, the, the mummy was... Uh, um, Boris Karloff, actually. Oh, he did that too. Yeah, okay. I, I, he he did he did that one originally, and the the creature from the black lagoon. Oh gosh, I don't even remember who who played that role. I, I or they just. I, I know Clint Eastwood early on was in Revenge of the Creature or Return of the Creature from the Black Lagoon, and uh, he actually got fired from Universal Studios after that movie. And he, and he got fired, ironically enough, the same day as a young actor named Burt Reynolds did, and they were both walking out, and, and, and uh, uh, it, it turned out that Clint Eastwood was fired because his Adam's apple was too big, and Burt Reynolds was fired because he couldn't act. And Burt Reynolds was kind of laughing at him and said, ha, 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 I can learn to act, but you'll never do anything about that Adam's apple. And and then later on, uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, they worked together in, in the movie City Heat. So, Do you remember the models that Aurora came out with, the Frankenstein models and the uh, werewolf, those plastic kits? Did you ever participate in any of that? No, I, I never had those, but I oh do remember Oh, my gosh, them. I loved them. I had them all, and I got rid of all of them, Stephen. All of well, them, they're gone. They're classics. Well, well, you know what happened? When they made the Hammer, field, the Hammer film versions of Frankenstein in the 50s in England, they were not allowed to, to copy the Boris Karloff uh, um, image because Universal Studios owned it. And so they had the makeup man, Philip Leakey, uh, experimenting on Christopher Lee's face, the, the one who played Frankenstein's monster in those movies. And Christopher Lee got so upset with, with, with what Leakey was doing, he, he was going to run him through with a sword. He was an ex-cavalry man. And, and Philip Leakey hit out for like four days and, and uh, came back when Christopher Lee had calmed down a little bit because... Only universal Frankensteins can look in that distinctive uh, way that the Karloff creature looked like. And, and, and I'll, t- I'll tell you something else about that. When Car- Karloff, I, I mean, he had a good sense of humor about playing Frankenstein, but he also used to make these sardonic remarks about them. He would, t- he would say, you know, I was only in three Frankenstein movies, but I get blamed for all nine. You know, or <laughs> who, I get- who would know? Yeah. yeah, or I get the fan mail and some other bloke gets the check. But when he died, uh, um, the obituary columns had a picture of Glenn Strange, who played Frankenstein in the last three, uh, House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, and Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. Uh, they had him in the Frankenstein makeup next to the story about Boris Karloff dying. Did you ever come across Vincent Price at all, Stephen? No, I never did. But again, he's a great character, and there are great stories about him. But he's one person I never met. He would have been really interesting to meet, I think. Uh, you know, he was from St. Louis. And right. when Michael Jackson put together his Thriller album, they wanted that Vincent Price laugh. Because right. that's what Vincent did. So they gave him an option to give him like twenty grand, or to take a percent of the album sales. And he elected to take the twenty thou up front. He yeah. would have made millions on the percent. Right, and he asked Michael. He asked Michael Jackson later on for for uh, more compensation for that, and he got a very disappointing letter saying, "You got paid what you got paid, and you're not getting a dime." Uh, yeah, anymore. a deal's a deal. Yeah, a deal's a deal. Was there a, was there a feud between Karloff and Lugosi? Um, if there was. It, it came from Lugosi. Uh, Karloff was always a, a 
you know, very, very nice. Um, Karloff would not do the movie Son of Frankenstein in 19, 1939 unless Lugosi got the, got the role as Igor. Um, so Karloff looked out for him. Um, and, and Lugosi, he had the, the frustrating situation that, that he was always billed behind Karloff, that Universal think, seemed to think higher of Karloff than, than, than they thought of him. Uh, you know, Lugosi had constant money trouble. He had a bad back, so he was taking drugs to alleviate the bad back. Um, there was one point uh, Lugosi didn't have a car, so he was getting around with roller skates. So he may have had some bitterness towards Karloff. The, the character that... that um, the the Martin Landau uh, version of Karloff in the movie Ed Wood, which swears, and, I'm sorry, of Lugosi in the movie Ed Wood, which who swears and puts down Karloff in that movie. Um, that version of Lugosi was really disputed by his family, and they said he wasn't like that at all. He was always cordial. But there was the one time when Lugosi was uh, doing a one-man play, and he was in some small town, and the little boy ran up to him and asked for his autograph, and he said to his, to his assistant, uh, you see, they know me everywhere. And then before he signed the autograph, and he said, he said to the little boy, and what is my name, young man? And the little boy said, Boris Karloff. I love that. I love that. You've got all kinds of great stories about what was going on there. There was even some stories about a studio executive giving Arnold Schwarzenegger some information about the Terminator. Advice? Yeah, it was Mike Metavoy. And Arnold initially had not wanted to play the Terminator. Um, one reason was at that time, Arnold was thinking about running for political office. And he was looking at Ronald Reagan's film career. And Ronald Reagan was in 47 movies, 46 times he played a good guy. Yeah. And then the final movie, The Killers, he played a bad guy. And, and Ronald Reagan just hated the idea of playing a bad guy. He was a former lifeguard, and he used to keep track of all the lives that he saved. So for him, playing a bad guy was you know, not palatable. And he, and he went to his agent at the time, Lou Wasserman, said, Lou, I don't want to play a bad guy. He said, Ronnie, you know, you're kind of a has-been. You, you should take whatever you can get. <laughs> And so he played the role, but, but he, he really didn't like it. And after it was over, he announced what his friends had been expecting him for, to do for years. He's going to retire from the move from Hollywood and go full-time into politics, although he still hosted the show Death Valley Days for a while. And then two years later, he was governor, and then 15 years later, he was president. And, and before I get to the Schwarzenegger, just a quick story. Uh, when Ronald Reagan became president, he had a meeting with um, Dan Rostenkowski, the congressman from Illinois, and he said, right. Danny, we're going to cut taxes. And you know why? Because I was in the movie Newt Rockney All-American in 1940. I became a big star. I signed a new contract, and I suddenly found myself in a 90% tax bracket, <laughs> Danny. 90%. Now, nobody in this country should pay 90%. Now, now what do you have to say about that? And, and Rostenkowski whistled. He said, 90%. My goodness, Mr. President, I never thought you were that good of an actor. <laughs> How true. And Reagan laughed his head off. That's cool. And uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I get back to Schwarzenegger. Um, you, you know, he had a meeting with Mike Metavoy, um, and he said, Arnold, what's this? You don't want to play the Terminator. And the Terminator made his career, didn't it? It really did. I mean, Conan the Barbarian was right before that. Yeah. But, but he didn't get good re reviews. No, of that wasn't like a good actor in that thing. No, he was considered very stiff in that movie. And and so he, he said, um, well, you know, he only has a couple of lines. And, and, and you know, I, 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 I don't really want to have my image be a bad guy. I think the good guy, you know, Reese is the better part. And, and Metavoy said, no, Arnold, the Terminator's the better part. Don't worry about how many lines you have. L listen, Arnold, when I was a kid, I saw this movie called Kiss of Death, and it starred Richard Widmark. And I don't remember a word he said. All I remember is he pushed an elderly lady in a wheelchair down the stairs and laughed like a maniac. And, and I'm telling you, people never forgot it. I never forgot it. So play a bad guy once, make an impression, and then you can move on to more heroic parts. 
and, and Arnold thanked him and, and agreed to play the Terminator. And, and you know, after Richard Widmark played that role, and, and maybe Mike Metavoy didn't know this, for, for a few months afterwards, he had encounters with elderly ladies in the street who would stop him and slap his face. <laughs> they really do believe it. They get into these things, don't they? It's really amazing. It's really amazing that Curly Howard had to wear a disguise in public because sometimes kids and other people would kick him in the shins. You know, I, I mean, just stuff like that happens. It's it's really amazing that George Reeves, you, you know, had a kid pull a gun out at him and said, hey, Superman, I've always wanted to see the bullets bounce off your chest. Yeah. How I dangerous mean, can that be? Jeez. Right. Right. You know, it's amazing that Brad Pitt goes into a liquor store after somebody saw the Fight Club and wants to challenge him to a fight. You know, it's amazing that Tommy Bond, the kid who played Butch and the Little Rascals, uh, got into fights all throughout school because people wanted to take him on because they thought Butch was such a bully. So uh, it's really amazing that, that people used to watch Gilligan's Island and call up the Coast Guard and demand the castaways be rescued. <laughs> but, you know, all these, all these things happen. So Quentin Tarantino, the great director, said once that Abbott and Costello's meets Frankenstein one of his favorite all-time movies. That's right. That's right. And, uh, yeah, Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. Uh, Universal um, 1948 trying to save their franchise, um, uh, franchises, and, and combine them. Um, you know, the, and that was the last go-round for the horror, the horror characters, uh, the Wolfman, uh, Dracula, and Frankenstein's monster. And, and the reason Tarantino liked it so much is because the, the monsters really played it straight. I mean, despite the fact that it's a comedy movie, they really mean business, and they're really coming after Abbott and Costello. And, and, and he said, that's exactly what I want to do with my movies, is, is to, you know, have the horror followed by the comedy, followed by the horror. It's all, it's, 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 it's kind of how Tarantino in some ways has modeled his career um, with, with the types of movies that's right. that he's made. With those old movies... The Frankensteins, the Draculas, the Wolfman, would they succeed today in Hollywood, Stephen? Um, well, they'd have to be more... Uh, um, Glamour? Uh, obvi uh, uh, well, obviously, they'd have to make more use of modern technology. Graf but, graphics and things but, like but that. But yeah, I, I think those stories could succeed at any time if they're done well. And, and, you know, you look at vampires, and it just keeps going and going and going. I, I mean, with... with you know, with Twilight, with shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, with a show like Angel, I, I mean, I mean, it, uh, the the Vampire Diaries, it just is a continuous, continuous oh, it, it's popular huge. popular thing. What's the demographic? See, in the old days, the demographics in Hollywood skewed a little older. Not right. anymore. Things are young now. P you know, younger people going to the movies more so than older folks. Things have changed, don't you think? Right, right. And, and the thing with Dracula is to keep uh, I, I, to, to keep him attractive. I mean, Bram Stoker didn't exactly mean for Dracula to be attractive. I think that's why Nosferatu, the the silent film version, yeah, the b ball hitting guy with two teeth or something, right? Like that. That's that that's the real Dracula. I mean, how he looks. But ever since Lug I mean, Lugosi was considered a sex symbol for playing that role, and and that that's an advantage you have playing Dracula versus versus say playing Frankenstein's monster, which which will probably I mean that that's a character Frankenstein's monster which seems to appeal more to children. But this this Hotel Transylvania, this animated version, is doing very well uh, with with uh, some of the old uh, Universal monster sure. characters. But the kids are the kids are watching that, right? Right, right. Okay, and, hold on, Stephen. We're going to hit this break. We're going to come back. Talk more about your work, Hollywood Stories, and we'll take some phone calls on Coast to Coast AM. With our special guest tonight, Stephen Showhead, his book, Hollywood Stories. We're going to come back in a moment, talk more about some of these horror classics, and also take your phone calls on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back with Stephen Showhead, and we're going to take your call. Stephen, would one consider Walt Disney's Snow, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs to be a a horror type, a cartoon film? Well, probably not today, but the British did um, ba back in the 30s. They wouldn't let it be shown there. They were banning all horror films. And, and uh, um, the uh, uh, the thing that really frightened people at the time was the, the queen.
queen's transformation into the peddler woman. Um, and and what, what happened was there was an actress playing that role uh, who was a great stage actress whose, whose name was Lucille Laverne. And Walt and the staff, they were happy when she did the queen, but when she had to change to the peddler woman, they were unsatisfied. And they said, oh, Lucille, you know, she, she's a, not beautiful anymore now. She's a hag. She's like a snake. We're not getting that from your performance. And she said, I think I know what you want. Will you excuse me? And she left the recording room, uh, came back about five minutes later and said, okay, let's do it now. So they re-recorded it, and this time she's on the money, and everybody there is getting thrills and chills, and she finishes, and, and they clap their hands, and, and Walt said, oh, Lucille, that was great, but what did you do when you left the room? And she smiled at him and said, I took my teeth out. <laughs> Unbelievable. And uh, I'll tell you what, they had uh, problems at Radio City Music Hall where the movie was breaking records because uh, some in 1938 because some of the kids would get so scared by that the evil uh, peddler woman that uh, the seats kept getting wet and they had to keep replacing them. Really? Yeah. That's that's bizarre. Yeah. Nin- it, at the time, it was a frightening movie. I you know I, I think. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's what happened with Disney's movies. Like Fantasia, for example, did not have the success of Snow White. That was a, a money loser when it came out. And, and a lot of parents felt that the final scene where the devil damns the souls, and, and the devil, by the way, the, the model for the devil was uh, Bela Lugosi. But, but uh, the Night on Bald Mountain sequence, was, it was felt that that was unfit for children. And so a lot of parents complained to movies movie theater managers at the time. There, there were a lot of things that happened with Walt Disney that, that weren't considered to be uh, family things. He, he sort of grew into that role at, uh, um, as a purveyor of family entertainment as time went on. 1958, The Blob with Steve McQueen. Well, he had the exact same thing that you were talking about with Vincent Price, they, uh, with Steve McQueen. They offered him... Three thousand uh, um, plus, like ten percent of the gross, or a straight ten thousand. And he needed the money, and he took the ten thousand. And he just would, it would frustrate him to no end that that movie just made a ton of profits, played on the Late Show all the time. So sometimes he would, you know, people would come up to him and say, "Hey, I saw you in the blob." I wasn't in that. I wasn't in that. You know, he would just deny it. And then other times. He'd be proud because it was the first time that his his sort of uh, king of cool persona came came off on the screen. But but most of the time he would just laugh because he's thinking, you know, I I, I mean here I am I'm playing a bug eyed teen being terrorized by a mound of jello. But but uh, you know he was like like so many actors upset that he chose not to take the share of the profits huh. and the money up front. Let's go to some of the calls. Aberdeen, New Jersey, first time caller. Jerry's with us. Hi, Jerry. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, uh, George. And uh, hi, uh, I don't know the name. Stephen. Of you. Stephen is our Stephen, guest. How, how you doing? Stephen. Stephen. Uh, glad to speak to you guys. Long time listener. First time caller. Um, when you guys were talking about uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon, you didn't know who played the creature. One of them was named Ben Chapman, and Ben did all the underwater sequences. Okay. They had several actors do it. But yeah. I, met, I met Ben Chapman at a memorabilia show. He passed on a couple of years ago. Was he? The, the, but he was a very, very nice guy. He was from Hawaii. They weren't credited, were they, the guys who did that at the time? No. Yeah. In fact, he showed me, uh, he showed me his contract, and uh, he was paid like, uh, you know, like $1,500. For, for, <laughs> and yeah. it was a lot of money then. Oh, yeah, well, again, yeah. That's... He said that to me. He said it was, you know, it was great money for the time, you know. Uh, and uh, I even uh, took a a copy of his contract and the pictures with him. He was a great guy. He was from from, from Hawaii. Another interesting uh, uh, thing, he was John Hall's cousin. John Hall was in the movie uh, Hurricane with Dorothy Lamore, if you remember. That's going way back. Oh, yeah, 1938. Way back. Okay, thanks for those tidbits, Jerry. Psycho 
still remains one of the scary movies. We talked a little bit about Norman Bates. How did Hitchcock ever conceive of that shower scene, Stephen? Well, uh, the shower scene is disguised is is uh, described in the Robert Block book. Now, the thing is that that actually, as violent as Psycho is considered to be, the Robert Block book was way way uh, uh, more graphic uh, of what what uh, Norman Bates did to uh, Marion. Um, uh, I think her name was Mary in the book, but 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 anyway, uh, you know, H- Hitchcock was always thinking of what could be done cinematically, and, and of course, there were a lot of things about that movie. The, the filming of, of it in black and white so he could use chocolate syrup rather than blood, putting up his own money for it so he used his television crew uh, um, because Paramount Studios was so reluctant to do it because he wanted to do something different at the time, and it really was different. See, see the, the one thing, Hitchcock always used to make a distinction between horror and suspense, and he always used to say, Horror doesn't take much thought. You know, if something jumps out at you, that's horrifying. It lasts for like two seconds. But suspense is when the audience knows something that the, that the characters don't know. Like say you have two guys talking at a table, and say you put a bomb underneath the table, and the audience knows that, and the two guys don't. The audience is dying for them to look under the table. Um, and, and you just stretch it out, stretch it out, stretch it out. Now, the thing was that, that he had made a movie two years before Psycho, which was really suspenseful, Vertigo, where, where the audience knew something that, that – um, um, the James Stewart character did not know. I won't give it away if, if people haven't right. seen it. Right. But that movie was a failure uh, at the box office. Although you know now it, it did well later on, of course. Yeah, now it's considered. You know, it got its just just do. Um, but but Hitchcock had, you know, he was always aware of what was going on. He was always aware of the news and the industry. And he saw that, that like these Edgar Allan Poe movies, these low-budget movies that Vincent Price was in where, and that William Castle was making some of these movies were doing great. And so he thought he would get into the low-budget horror realm, but do it, do it as cinematically as possible. And he came up with the gimmick um, where he actually killed a movie star uh, early on into the movie for the absolute shock value. And, and, and you know, the, Psycho was such an enormous hit. I mean, it was, it, you know, it, it just did terrifically with audiences, but it was a, a bit of an embarrassment for Hitchcock because he, he'd go to parties and, and people would say to him, Hitch, how could you make that disgusting movie? And he'd say, oh, it's a comedy. Don't take it so seriously. <laughs> But, but but there were other times where where he would lament that that you know that why didn't they like Vertigo Vertigo which is my gourmet meal and instead they eat the hamburger and French fries which is psycho and and uh, just to uh, to jump ahead with that you, you know Hitchcock um, sold the rights of Psycho back to Universal Studios and he became the number three stockholder at Universal Studios and so. He made his final movie in 1975, um, Family Plot, and, and, and he's 75 years old. He gets to the set early, pick up the Wall Street Journal. Every day he's happy because there's this new movie, Jaws, and it's breaking records, and the Universal MCA stock is going through the roof. And then there was one day he was there early, and he felt uncomfortable, and, and it's like he had eyes in the back of his head. And he called over one of the security guards and said, there's a young man hovering over there in the background. Have him removed at once. And it turned out that the young man was Steven Spielberg, the source of Hitchcock's happiness, who just simply wanted to meet his idol. <laughs> did and, they ever uh, meet? He did. They did. They did. But, but you know, he kept showing up. And, and and one of the stars of the movie, uh, uh, hit Bruce Stern, Hitchcock would always say, Bruce, what does that young man want? Well, he wants to meet you, Hitch. Well, Bruce, he made that fish movie. I don't know what to say to him. But but eventually, uh, you know, they did meet, and Hitchcock was gracious. Of course, Spielberg, he always paid Hitchcock such a high compliment because the shark never worked in Jaws, and therefore uh, Spielberg had to imply the shark was there with the with the music and that's the barrels, right uh, which and is called, hitchcockian isn't it that's right that's the word he used hitchcockian that's exactly what it is let's go to charleston west virginia it's james turn on coast to coast hey james go ahead good morning how are you gentlemen good, good. james good how you good. doing 
I'm doing fine. I wanted to let you know uh, that uh, other people that played uh, in some of those, uh, Lugosi did play the uh, Frankenstein's monster. Yes, and, he did. Ghost of Frankenstein. Right, and he had lines in it. If you ever take a chance of, of, of watching it, you'll yeah. see his mouth move. They edited the lines out, but he's actually talking, and right. he's supposed to portray the creature as being blind because right. of the preceding movie, he had lost his eyesight. Yeah, and he col- he collapsed on the set. He was suffering yes. from ox- oxygen. Did, yeah, he, well, yeah, there were nine of those movies, and, and right. uh, he, you know, uh, Boris retired after the third one, Son of Frankenstein. Well, not retired, but chose not to play the role anymore. Right. And then Bella finally got to play him, and Lon Chaney played him, and Glenn Strange played him. So And, Ch- and Chaney Jr. played uh, the mummy, and the cowboy actor Tom Tyler played him in one motion pic- played the mummy in one motion picture. Yeah. And Rico Browning was the other person who did the dive scenes for the creature from and the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah. And uh I had you were talking about meeting actors. I had the honor and her name escapes me now. Um the woman that played Sylvia Van Buren in War of the Worlds. I had the honor of meeting her at one time during a anniversary of the movie. Was this the original? Yes. Way gone back. Yeah. Yes, when Gene Barry, Les Tremaine was all in it, the George Powell version, I, I got to meet her uh, during my first tour of duty in the military. I was at a convention in New York, and she was working behind at a desk, and I walked away, and I saw it. I saw she had been in Tom Corbett's Space Cadet on that television. Was, that was Ann Robinson. Yes, and I started to walk away, and I went, I turned around and went, Sylvia Van Buren, and she said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and but she was a very very nice lady. Uh, I met Forrest J. Ackerman just by accident. I bumped into him in a hallway at a convention I was at in in California at one time. He was just passing through. And he was an interesting fellow. Great you people. know, I've had good luck every not every single time, but ninety five percent of the time I've, I've met actors. They've just been gracious and and willing to talk and are flattered. You know, so it's it's I, I mean, you know, as long as you're not intrusive. Um, you, you know, it's just high by, you know, they're, if they're going by, you know, I think they're very polite, but you know, if they're sitting at a table with their girlfriend, their wife or friends, you can't sit down with them. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> and I've seen that happen, Steve. Yeah. I, I mean, but, but, you know, it's really, it, it's part of their job too. I mean, I, I mean, uh, uh, I, I think I read one time that, you know, it's 5% acting and 95% promoting. You know what, so that's, it's, that's exactly gracious. right. Yeah, so being gracious is just, I, I mean, it, it can't hurt. I mean, you know, there's a, another story about Michael Caine. I, at Universal Studios, he was making this movie one time, and uh, I think it was Harry Sundowner, but it might be another movie. And the tour guide um, kept finding him and leading people to, to meet and greet him. And he was thinking about getting the tour guide fired. And, and, and finally he said, you know, it's just easy to be gracious. Why not go along with it? And it was a very good thing because the tour guide turned out to be Michael Ovitz, who later started Creative Artist that's, Agency. That's right. Yeah, one of the biggest agencies in Hollywood. So, so you know, it was an object lesson about just being gracious to everybody. Small world, isn't it? Yeah. It really is. Why the craze of those films in that era? What was going on during society in order for people to be so excited about those kind of horror films? I mean, we had, remember the black and white one, Them, about those radioactive ants, those huge ants? Well, sure. In the, you know, in the 50s, I, I mean, every era is different. In the 50s, it's you know, atomic, atomic. radiation, yeah. uh, you know, and more science fiction. Sure. Film. Which was uh-huh. huge in the Japanese films at the time. Right. Right. Uh, um, you know, but, but I, I don't know. I, I mean, a lot of films play at drive-in movie theaters and things like that. And, and, and you know, who knows if people are watching them even <laughs> you know, when, they're, when they're going to see them. It's just, I, I mean, you know, they're just something that appealed at the time. It's, it, it's always interesting to say why, oh, something, uh, you know, why one genre is popular. The thing about horror movies is, is they can be so cheap to make. I, I, I mean, uh, you know, for entry level filmmakers, if they come up with certain ideas, like, 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 uh, 
uh, Wes Craven, he wasn't exactly entry level, but but he he uh, you know used to see this hobo walking home from school, and he combined him with this bully in school named Freddy, and so that that's how he got the idea for Freddy Krueger or or uh, 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 oh, what's his name? Toby. Uh, I can't remember his name right now, but he's the one who uh, directed um, uh, Poltergeist for Spielberg. Uh, I think it's Toby Hooper. He he was in line at a hardware store, and he had this fantasy about getting a chainsaw off the wall and cutting through everybody, and that's what inspired the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So yeah, Toby I, I, Hooper. That's who it was. Toby Hooper. Yeah. So so I I, I mean, and then, and then you have. Uh, you know, even more modern movies made for like twenty thousand dollars, Paranormal Activity or The Blair Witch Project, um, or, or a movie like The Sixth Sense, which which really didn't start off being. I, I mean, it w- really wasn't a high budget movie, and 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 you know they decided to take a shot at asking Bruce Willis to do it, and he loved the script so much that he agreed to do it for a much lower fee um, and not get his usual twenty million dollar salary. So. So, uh, I mean, with horror movies, uh, from a filmmaking standpoint, um, they give you an opportunity to, to, to really have a chance of breaking into the business. And I think if you have those uh, sort of Hitchcock elements where what you don't see is scarier than what you do see, I, I think it's a universal thing. I, I don't think it belongs to any age, particularly. I, I think something like that always has a chance to catch on. I remember the days of those drive-ins going with my parents, wearing my pajamas with the feet, going to get a hot dog, walking through the gravelly parking lot, and then falling asleep in the back seat. It was great. Yeah. What yeah, a, well, I, what I a think, time! Yeah, I think I think people often did other things, but besides watch the movies at the drive. Yeah, that's true. Of course, not when you're with your family, right? Stephen, tell us about the book Hollywood Stories. Where do you get it? Sure, the book Hollywood Stories: Short, Entertaining Anecdotes About the Stars and Legends of the Movies. Available wherever books are sold: Amazon, Barnes and Noble. The website is HollywoodStories.com with all the links. One word: HollywoodStories.com, and that has information about the, the tourism too. You, you enjoy doing what you do, don't you? I really enjoy telling stories. Really enjoy meeting people. Um, you know, I enjoy writing quite a bit, and it's it's nice to get good feedback on the book. Stephen, we're going to come back and have final phone calls with you in just a moment here on Coast to Coast AM. Those of you who are on hold, just hang there, and I shall be right back with you with our special guest Stephen Showett as we talk about his work, Hollywood Stories. Much more to come on Coast to Coast AM. Well, those Friday night into Saturday morning open lines start next hour. Hey, by the way, Ghost to Ghost coming up on Halloween night. Would you like to participate? Send us your ghost story to ghost stories at coasttocoastam.com. You can find all that information and the link at our highlight reel at coasttocoastam.com. Let's come back and take final phone calls with Stephen Showett as we talk about his stories on Hollywood Stories, his book, and all these spooky things next on Coast to Coast AM. Stephen, we're dear friends with uh, Kane Hutter, of course, who was Jason Voorhees in the Friday the 13th movies. And, you know, it's it's funny. You're right. You, you kind of expect them in real life to act that way. And they right. don't. When you meet them, they're nice. They're fun. They're funny. But the, they're, they're, they're I definitely don't, I don't not know if funny. I... I don't know if I expect him to act that way, you know, but uh-huh. I'll tell you what, Vincent Price, though, he used to go to the Hollywood Wax Museum. I don't know how often he did this, maybe once or twice, but he disguised himself as a wax dummy of himself. And just stand like, there, huh? <laughs> yeah, stand there, wait till somebody unsuspecting would walk by and then reach out and squirt them with a hypodermic syringe full of water. <laughs> That's him. That's Vincent Price. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't usually expect people to act that way, but, but uh, you, you know, I guess, I guess some do. Who is yeah, your, I mean, I, who's your all-time favorite horror star? Oh well, does Ernest Borgnine count since he was in Willard and actually had to be covered with rats and got bit and got a, tet- a tetanus shot? I, I, I don't he, know. He was McHale in the in the Navy show, wasn't he? Right. That's his main thing, and. I, you know, I don't know if you consider Poseidon Adventure a movie, but I think he's my all-time favorite actor, really. Um, I, 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 do I have a minute to tell a story about him? Yes, you sure do. 
Okay, when he was uh, when when he was in the movie Marty, his Academy Award winning winning movie, he was walking back to the set, and and um, uh, the, these four are walking back to to his uh, dressing room from the set. These four guys came up to him and said, "Hey, are you the guy who beat up Sinatra and From Here to Eternity?" And he goes, "Yeah, that was me." He goes, "Well, now we're going to beat you up." And, and, and Whoa. He said, yeah, and, and he said, all right, listen, I'll fight you one at a time. But, you know, I'm not going to take all four of you on at once, but you're making a mistake. Sinatra and I are buddies. We're Passan. That's only a movie. And he said, Passan, are you Italian? He says, yes, the family name is Borganino. Uh, my mother changed it when we came over to America. He goes, well, why didn't you say so? And they ended up taking him out to lunch instead, Whoa. and they treated him to meals for the rest of the shoot. I love it. To the phones we go, west of the Rockies, Calistoga, California. Michael's turn. Michael, you're on with us. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, George. Hi, Michael. I grew up in a um, little town of uh, Brookfield, Illinois. I know it well. You do? Yeah, sure do. It's, uh, I used to go to Illinois a lot. Ah, yeah. Well, uh, at that time, there was this little theater in town, the Strand Theater, and one summer... Every Wednesday night, they'd play two of these classic Universal films. So I've probably seen every one of them. It was amazing. What was your favorite? Huh? What was your favorite? Your favorite? Oh, God. I, I think... Uh, they were all great. Yeah, they were. They were. Uh, you know, just about anything with Boris Karloff. How much did it cost you, Michael, to get to the uh, theater in those days? Well, you know... At that time, I'm not. I can't remember exactly, but I remember at one time, kids could get in for nine cents. <laughs> this was in the forties. Nine cents. I mean, yeah. that, that, when when you think about a movie like Snow White, uh, uh, when it came out in 1937 and ran through 1938, it made eight million dollars. And movie tickets cost twenty five cents for adults and a dime for kids. So if you do the math, it's like half the people in the country saw it. And you know what? Today, it probably would have been one of the highest grossing movies if you could multiply that. Right. Yeah, it, 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 it's way up there. So, um, you know, I, uh, when you consider inflation and everything like that. So, I, I mean, I mean, uh, most movies weren't big hits like that, but, but uh, you know, the ones that did made an incredible amount of money. That, that's why... Uh, you know, World War One was one of the big things that that really helped Los Angeles economically because the European film industry really slowed down because of that, and that's when American movies became popular around the world. And then you had people like Chaplin and Pickford and Fairbanks started making enormous amounts of money, like a million dollars a year at a time when the average house in L.A. cost $2,000. And then that's when L.A. really started to become more of a boom town with the movie industry growth. Do you find when you're, when you're doing your, uh, your tour guiding that people are interested still in Marilyn Monroe, Stephen? Marilyn Monroe's always a, a big interest. She's probably the, the most popular uh, handprint and footprint square at the Chinese theater. And I can tell a quick story about that. Uh, when she got her handprints and footprints, it was in 1953, and she was promoting the movie Gentlemen Prefer Blonde. And and uh, she was absolutely thrilled because she that, that theater has been around since 1927, and she used to go there and watch movies as a little girl, and she'd always compare her hands and her feet to uh, that of her idols, Jean Harlow's. So it was just thrilling for her to be out there and have this actually happening to her. It's, it's still pretty rarefied air, only about 250 handprint and footprint recipients. So she's standing out there with Jane Russell, and there's a big crowd, and she's blowing kisses. And, and she says to Jane Russell, oh, hey, look, Janie, not everybody puts their hands and feet in the wet cement. you got Jimmy Durante's nose, Monty Woolley's beard. You know, I think we should put in the body parts we're going to be most remembered for. And, and, and she actually held up the ceremony and asked the 20th Century Fox officials if she could sit in the wet cement and Jane Russell could stick her chest into it. But uh, they said no, unfortunately, for the photographers there, so they had to settle for their hands and feet. I love it. Okay, we go to uh, Tacoma, Washington. Hey, Howard, go ahead. First-time caller. Yes, uh, this is uh, George. Hi, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you guys were talking about the classic monster movies, yeah. Uh, things uh, like the Blob, them. Yep. 
Um, what about the movie like the the original The Thing? Yeah, the Howard Hawks movie. That was a classic, Stephen. Yeah, it was. It was. Howard Hawks was a great character too. I, I, I you know, I, I, I offhand, I, I can't tell you a, a really good story about that movie, but I can tell you that Howard Hawks was the one who directed the movie I just mentioned, Gentlemen Prefer Blonde. And and uh, he didn't necessarily want to work with Marilyn Monroe because she was late to the set all the time. And, and he was in Daryl Zanuck's office, the, the head of 20th Century Fox, and he said, I'll direct the movie under one condition. You get me Jane Russell. And he says, Howard, we tried to get Jane Russell, but she's unavailable. He said, no, she's not. Give me the phone. So he called Jane Russell up. Uh, on Daryl Zanuck's phone, and, and uh, it turned out that Howard Hawks had discovered, along with Howard Hughes, uh, Jane Russell back in 1939, uh, 14 years before when she was 18, and, and working in a dentist office for $10 a week. So she'll do anything for Howard Hawks. So he gets her on the phone and says, honey, I want you for the new Monroe picture. Says, okay, Howard, when do we start? Said, oh, you're great, honey. How much do you want? says, Howard, do you think you can get me 50000 So he's still on the phone. He eyes Daryl Zanuck. No, I don't think so, honey. Try again. 75000 <laughs> Oh, you're playing hardball. Give me another number. So the conversation went on for about three minutes, and finally Howard Hawks cupped the receiver, and he said to Daryl Zanuck, great news. I got her down to 200000 I love it. And uh, Daryl Zanuck agreed, and it turned out to be a very good choice. And, uh, huh. you know, I, I will uh, try and get some good stories about this thing. I don't have any at the top of my head, but, uh, you know, I'll try and uh, I'm writing a second book. So Stephen, what did you think of the old black and white compared to color films? Uh, I don't really care that much. You know, it, it, that that's something that never... Um, never makes a difference to me. I mean, if it's a great movie, like It's a Wonderful Life or Mr. Smith goes to Washington and moves along, I, I, I'm not really, uh, you know, I'm not really, um, I don't really have a preference, you know, a Casablanca, whatever it is. But I like modern movies, too. So, they, I, I mean, I, I go more for pace um, than, than, uh, than, you know, looking whether it's color or black and white. And sometimes, you know, with color movies, I, I like I, I like fantastic scenery and and uh, set design. I, I really enjoyed the movie, the remake of True Grit uh, that the Coen Brothers did a couple of years ago. I thought that was just about the best production design I've ever seen in a movie. Now, oh, John Wayne was in the original, right? Yes, he was. He was, and they got great stories about him. We're going to Wichita, Kansas now. Chuck, you're on with us. Go ahead, Chuck. Uh, Good evening. Uh, I had a couple of questions for Stephen. Uh, I've always heard that Alfred Hitchcock uh, would appear in all of his movies and shows in a bit part uh, during some interval during the show, just show up. You know. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Uh, you know, he, he did that initially to, to just he, – he had a scene in one of the early movies, and he was just trying to, to – fill it up with more people so he stood in and then uh the movie uh, i it was either the pleasure garden or the lodger it was a big success so he started doing it because of superstition and, and i'll tell you his toughest job with that was was lifeboat because because you know you got seven people on a lifeboat so how do you get hitchcock into the middle of the ocean right. so <laughs> he, he had a, a magazine roll by and hitchcock had just lost some weight and so it had a before and after shot with this phony product called Reduso, which and he uh, was in it. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he just he just made it up, Reduso. But then he got tons of letters saying, "Where can we buy this product?" <laughs> it didn't exist. Yeah, one other thing, uh, I had, there was a uh, movie, and I can't remember the name or anything of it, but uh, it's like a black. Uh, Lady Dracula, real sexy and more black. Elvira? Elvira, right? Elvira, right. And I heard uh, that the uh, actress was from Kansas. Oh, Cassandra Peterson? Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but, you know. We, we one, one other Cassandra. thing, you mentioned Marilyn Monroe. I fought with the 1st Marine Division in Korea during the war over there. And Marilyn came over as one of the few that did, Terry Moore and, and Marilyn Monroe. And it was in a rear area, and I wasn't able to go, but they had to build her a special heated stage. She wore the short costumes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I'll tell you, um, uh, I, I, I never met Marilyn Monroe, obviously. She she passed 
uh, you know, before I was born. But I'll tell you, I did meet uh, Zsa Zsa Gabor. By the way, Cassandra Peterson was born in Manhattan, Kansas. But uh, Zsa Zsa Gabor, um, uh, she was so nice to everybody. We, we met her on the tour. And uh, she always went with Bob Hope whenever he would entertain the troops. And I'll tell you, Bob Hope would have a tough time sometimes because people were saying, oh, are we going to get a nice dressing room? And he'd say, oh, we're going to a combat zone in Korea. What are you talking about? But Zsa Zsa Gabor, she'd go with him every time. She'd do anything for the troops. And, and they had the running gag where they go out on stage and Bob Hope would say, Zsa Zsa, is it true you don't have any domestic skills at all? And she'd say, no, Robert, darling, what are you talking about? I'm a great housekeeper. Every time I get the divorce, I keep the house. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, too. Let's go to take a few more calls, and then uh, that's it. Stephen, thanks, by the way, for oh, being I on the show. It. You're doing a great job here. We're going out to Hawaii. Vonnie's with us way west. Hey, Vonnie, go ahead. Hi. I'm way west. Oh, I love this show. Uh, Aloha, George. Aloha, Stephen. Aloha. I wish I was there. (laughs) I loved your story about Ernest Borgnine. Uh, What a wonderful, wonderful, incredible man he was. He was. He's my all-time favorite. Ernest Ernest Borgnine on the set of The Single Guy. And I was just a bit player uh, in the show. But I saw Ernest sitting in a chair, and I walked up to him, and I said, Mr. Borgnine, I have to tell you what a huge fan I am of you. Uh, And I loved the movie Marty. It's one of my all-time favorite movies. And I said, I know you probably get really tired of hearing this your whole life. Uh, And he said, oh, no, no, young lady, I never, never get tired of hearing that. I love when my – he was so gracious, so wonderful. And he he was just – so incredible, and he said, "I love hearing it every single time. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how many times people tell me that. I love it, and I appreciate that so much." You, you know, so I, I have uh, gracious. I loved him. I, I love. I, I, he's. I think he's my favorite actor, and I, I have the the DVD, the audio commentary for for. Uh, um, the Poseidon Adventure by the director Ronald Neem, and he was saying that when he made the movie, um, that every actor would have a bit of temperament, and you know it, it wouldn't last. But that meant if you had ten actors, you get it every single day if you're him. But he said the two actors that didn't have the the, the temperament were Eric Shea, the, the little boy who never acted in another movie again. He said, and Ernest Borgnine. Ernest Borgnine was the only one who never complained. And it's so uh, ironic because his character in that movie is constantly complaining about their predicament. But but he said he was just an absolute joy to work with. And everybody said that. Peckinpah said that on The Wild Bunch. I, I mean, everybody said that, that, that Ernest Borgnine was just the, the greatest guy. So, you know, and... and, and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, he'll be missed by a lot of people. So tell me a little bit about uh, Planet of the Apes, the people dressing up as monkeys, scaring people. What was going on with that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they had the interesting thing when they made that movie back in 1968. Um, uh, Charlton Heston noticed right away that the chimps hung with the chimps, the orangutans hang, hung with the orangutans, and the gorillas did the same uh, during lunch. And, in fact, Kim Hunter and, and uh, Maurice Evans were good friends uh, before the movie, but once she became a chimp, and he became an orangutan. He couldn't speak to each other when they, you know, when they when they didn't have scenes together. And and uh, Roddy McDowell, um, he, he uh, hated taking off his makeup at the end of the day. So sometimes he'd drive down the freeway in the ape outfit, you know, <laughs> four o'clock in the afternoon, stuck in traffic. And although people probably just thought it was another guy in L.A. the way things are around here, you never know. But, uh, yeah, but but Roddy McDowell, when he was making the movie, he found out that Julie Andrews was making um, the movie Star about Gertrude Lawrence at the same time on the 20th Century Fox a lot, and he knew Julie Andrews because they were in the play Camelot together, um, and and you know she was going through a tough time. Uh, she she uh, had won the Academy Award for Mary Poppins, and then and then 
the big hit with the sound of music, but then she had divorced uh, her husband, Tony Walton, and, and she was in therapy. Um, and, and one time she was on the phone in her dressing room talking about whatever problems uh, that she was having, and all of a sudden she's like, oh, there's a giant ape in here with me. And, and so uh, anyway, he chased her around for a little bit, I guess, but then, then revealed who he was. We've got Bruce now in Asheville, North Carolina. Bruce, you're on with Stephen. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, hi guys. How you hi, doing? Good. How you doing? Uh, we had a family business in New Jersey, and we hired a secretary. And I asked her what she did before this, and she said I was an actress. And I said, really? I said, what did you play in? She said, well, when I went to the University of Pennsylvania, I was one of the flesh eaters in Night of the Living Dead, Whoa. and. They said that, uh, she told me that they didn't pay anybody. It was just show up and wear your raggedy stuff. What a deal. Yeah, I thought in the, I thought they'd get at least $5 or something. Or Nothing. something. Yeah, but I mean, it was, I think the whole movie only cost like $7,000 or 17000 something like that. Yeah, well, I, I know George Romero knew a, a butcher in Pittsburgh who helped him with uh, what looked like the body parts and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, they, Well, they had to improvise in those days, Stephen. They right. didn't have graphics and all that. Right. So, well, again, uh, that's, that's why, you know, you go back to Ernest Borgnine actually being covered with rats or Tippi Hendren actually be, being covered with birds. I mean, people don't have to go through that, uh, you know, as much anymore with the CGI, the computer-generated images. So that's good. Very good. Stephen, thanks for being on the program. Keep in touch with us, okay? You got it. And the website, if people want to go to it, is hollywoodstories.com. You got it. We're going to come back in a moment. A couple hours to go now. Those Friday night and the Saturday morning open lines. Plus, I think I'll open up a hotline tonight back in a